Okay, hey, it's the Apple Podcast by MaxFuture.com, and this is episode 62, and it's Saturday morning, March 12th, 2011, and I'm sorry, sorry I did not get the podcast out on Friday like I usually do or try to do. Uh, It's been a crazy, crazy last couple of days for me at MaxFuture.com. This is Lex, Lex at MaxFuture.com. And why has it been crazy? Well, I'll go more into this in my other podcast, the iPad podcast. But as many of you know, yesterday, the iPad 2 went for sale. And in the last few days, in the last week or so, I've been been busy uh, with things related to the iPad because, well, one, I wanted to get the iPad 2, and I also sold my first iPad in, um, in doing so. So let's just, um, let's cover, let's cover some of this stuff, okay? So um, first, you know, I decided I wanted to get an iPad too. I had the original iPad I got on, I got on um, April 3rd, 2010, and I really liked it. It's a 64 gigabyte iPad and uh, I used it a lot and it you know it was great it was a great device and so I decided as March 11th approached I decided you know what I was gonna go for it go for the iPad 2 and why did I decide to do that well I mean the iPad was a great device it is a great device the first generation but why would I want to go up to an iPad 2, you know, because it's not like it's just, you know, massive, massive sea change or improvements from the iPad to the iPad 2. To recap, the main improvements that Apple was touting is that it is 15% lighter, that it's 33% thinner, that has a front camera and a back camera, and that that it has a GPS, and that it has a processor that's a dual core processor, so that the processor is twice as fast, and the video processing is up to nine times as fast. And throw in a gyroscope. So basically, if you had to sum it up, it's that it was lighter and thinner, um, faster, and had camera cameras and better precision for gaming so that and i thought you know it's worth it and here's why it's worth it for me i thought well first the main reason was the processor speed because the ipad is very quick and and zippy but i know from my past experience with the iphone upgrading from the 3g to the 3gs and then finally to the iphone 4 that the processor speed in these i devices as they you may think your your phone is ideal when you get it but when you get the next version it has faster speeds and it is more responsive it really changes the whole i don't know performance and feel of the device like the iphone 4 is just so responsive and such a great workhorse uh, smartphone that it just it's just massively better than the let I got the iPhone 3G I did not get the original iPhone I skipped the first year which because it was only on the edge network but you know where I work I've been trying to convince some people you know we have a lot of blackberries to go with the iPhone and this was you know a couple of years ago and I had the 3G and the 3GS because like most enterprise areas uh, you know, everyone's using Blackberries. And the problem with Blackberries are that they're only really good for a couple of things. Uh, Receiving and sending email and maybe putting things into your calendar and outlook into notes. But they're not really good for two critical things that all smartphones really need right now, which are the ability to, to quickly and efficiently and with great vision surf the internet so the blackberry browser stinks and also to 
manage documents and view documents and also great apps. And the BlackBerry has some apps, but they're not really good. And forget documents. You know, where I work, the ability to read PDF attachments and Word attachments to emails, you know, is, is, is something very useful and something very necessary. Yet you really can't read them on the BlackBerry. Yeah, there's a program that allows you to view them, but it's just the whole interface. You have to scroll with some little trackball. And you can't even see it, see the document. It, it doesn't really resolve very quickly. So, you know, going back though, I was trying to tell this person go with the iPhone. And I remember he had the 3G iPhone, and he found it not to be responsive enough. And at the time, I had the 3GS iPhone, and I was trying to tell him, look, there's just a seat. You know, you go up from the 3G to the 3GS. And it's just so much quicker because I think at the time he found the 3G to be a little slow in terms of, you know, uh, switching through between apps and opening apps and and viewing a document and scrolling a document on the iPhone. But now we're up to the iPhone 4 and the iPhone 4 is blazing fast. And, you know, I think corporate America is starting to notice this. And so... I took that thinking because really, you know, I, d I do not regret for a moment that I stood in line last summer and on the first day and made a reservation for the iPhone 4 and got the iPhone 4 after a year of using the 3GS. I, and, and the thing that I really appreciate the most about the iPhone 4 is that it had a better camera and it's just a much faster processor because it just makes the whole experience of flipping through, you know, panes on the uh, iPhone and through apps and switching through apps just makes it much quicker. And when a device has that sort of quickness and responsiveness, it really transforms the device. It's something that Apple is seeing now with the with the MacBook Air that has SSD drives, even though the processor speed is technically slower than, let's say, you know, MacBook Pros, Apple has done something between the software and the SSD drives and to make it quicker. So for everyday use, for surfing the internet, for opening documents. So that's my thinking, which was that, look, I'm not going to regret having twice as fast processor on the iPad and nine times the the video performance. I'm not going to regret that and I'm not going to regret having a little lighter, a little thinner device. And I'm not going to regret having extra features like cameras and a gyroscope. So that was my thinking. Now, you know, these devices aren't exactly cheap. I mean, the cheapest iPad with um, 16 gigabytes brand new for iPad 2 is the same as it was last year, $499. And, you know, for some people that's not a lot of money, but for everyday people in America, everyday people in America, like me, everyday people in America who are seeing people lose their jobs out there and people having a hard time, we shouldn't be callous about this and say, hey, just go out and splurge on an iPad 2. So... I decided to look into, well, could I sell my iPad? And then how much would it cost to upgrade to the iPad 2? So my original iPad was a 64 gigabyte Wi-Fi only iPad. And that originally retailed for $699 with tax that came, I guess, a little over 700, maybe, I don't know, 720. And so... I went on eBay and I, you know, saw how much they were going for. And they looked like they were going for, I don't know, 500, 550, 580. But then, remember, Apple announced the iPad 2 on March 2nd. And shortly thereafter, Apple announced that it was giving, it was dropping the price of the I, the first generation iPads by $100. So that meant the brand new 64 gigabyte iPad first generation was now selling for 599 
So I decided to go the eBay route. Uh, there are these other sellers like Gazelle. Gazelle will just quote you a price. You'll describe the condition and they'll pay you if the way you described it fits out. But Gazelle, I found you don't get as, as, as higher prices on, on, on eBay because Gazelle obviously is building in some sort of profit for itself. So it can then resell the refurbished used iPad. So anyways, I did some research and I decided that I would make my reserve price for the iPad $425. I just had sort of that hit me as I don't what's a reserve price? The way eBay works is you can you can make the reserve price zero, which means if there's an auction for your item that you're selling, then if it's zero reserve price, then you have to sell it at whatever price the highest bid is. So if the highest bid on the iPad that I was selling was $10 with a zero reserve, I would have to sell it for $10. That's if my starting price was at zero. So the reserve price is um, the price that anything below the reserve price and you will not sell it. Even if there is a winning bidder, if the winning bid comes below the reserve price, you will not sell it. So I decided the reserve price would be $425. But then I decided, you know, the and, the and the people who are bidding don't know what your reserve price is. They do know, though, if their bid has met the reserve price. And I decided my starting bid, just to get people interested, because it was, you know, kind of ridiculous that it would be that, would be $20. So with, um, I decided, you know, with $20 as the starting price, I th figured that would get interest. And I set it down for a seven-day auction. I believe you could set it down for a three-day auction or a 10-day auction. And I figured, I don't know, seven days would bring it to March 10th, which was the day before, or March, the evening of March 9th, which was almost you know more a little more than 24 hours before the iPad 2 would go on sale and it's interesting so there was some bidding at first the price you know for for days the price there were bids at like $20 and $20 and 50 cents and nothing much happened and then when i got within a day or two of the um the final day the bidding got up to like, I don't know, $100 or $200, still well below my reserve price. And then the last day, in the hours, you know, towards the end of the auction, I guess they were, I could see on eBay, you could see how many people are watching the uh, item. You know, it looked like there were, I don't know, 20, 30 people watching it. And the bid started going up into the $300 range. Remember, my reserve price was $425. I also put in, I told people I'm going to charge them $15, and I was going to ship it priority U.S. mail and ship it only in the 48 U.S. states. So I did that because I didn't want to figure out, you know, how much it's going to cost to ship it to, you know, strange parts of the world or far distant lands of the world. So anyways, here's the funny thing. So I was worried I, it wasn't going to sell because... As the minutes were approaching close to my reserve price of $425 and $15 shipping, it still seemed like the, the bidding was far away from what it needed to be so that it met my reserve price. And I guess what, it was at like three fifty or something like that. But then all of a sudden, in the final seconds, like it, final 20 seconds, there was a flurry of bidding. And get this, the final bid, the winning bid, was exactly $425. So they didn't know what my reserve price was, but the winning bid, which came in with seconds to go, somehow figured out or put in a bid that met my reserve price. So I sold it for $425 plus 15 shipping. I sent it to a person in North Carolina, and I sent it by, uh, sent it by United States Postal Service. The iPad fits perfectly into the flat rate medium box that's what's great about the ipad i had the original ipad box and i put it in the medium u.s postal box and i bought some insurance i think altogether the shipping cost me 20 bucks so anyways that's it 
so for you know so on thursday i shipped it the 10th and i was without an ipad and i felt kind of sad but renewal is a good thing okay so on the morning of friday march 11th apple started selling online at 4 a.m eastern time the ipad 2. So I happened to wake up sometime, I don't know, between 4 and 5 a.m. Eastern Time to check it out. And when I went there, I saw that the shipping time for all the iPad 2s was 3 to 5 business days. And I was kind of, I was thinking of maybe just buying it online and having it shipped. And I thought it would, you know, it would ship that day and would come on Monday. But when I saw 3 to 5 business days, you know, a business day excludes weekends and so three to, that wouldn't ship until the following Wednesday or Thursday so I sort of hesitated and I thought no I'll go to a store even though there'll be crowds I'll buy the iPad 2 in a store but about an hour later when I checked the shipping time online for the iPad 2 for all models had increased from three to five business days to five to seven business days and I thought, oh, no, what's going on? Maybe, you know, maybe this is going to be huge. And plus there was this whole, you know, this horrible earthquake occurred in Japan, too. So this is all happening on iPad Day. You know, this terrible earthquake that's killing people in Japan. And so I thought, why don't I buy the iPad? Because at least I'll know. I can always cancel it. See, the beauty is... You can cancel with Apple if you buy online um, anytime before it ships. And then after it ships, you can return it. And I don't think there's a stocking fee anymore when you return an item that is un unopened. So I ordered the 64 gigabyte black I iPad on 3G with AT&T. And my reasoning for not getting the pure Wi-Fi one was that uh, there may be instances when I'm willing to pay the ad hoc fee with with a 3G provider like Verizon or AT&T. Uh, you know, if we're on a trip somewhere, the family, or I just really need it. And, um, you know, so for $125 more, that's what the 3G adds. I thought it was good insurance. And then I also thought, you know, which way should I go, Verizon or AT&T? Now, the problem is, I'm really torn because I've had AT&T and lately in New York, AT&T has been poor, at least where I work downtown. On the other hand, when AT&T 3G is connected well, the download and upload speeds are much faster, I think twice as fast as any data on Verizon because they're on different types of networks. So Verizon is more, um, I guess, you connect more often and you have fewer dropped calls. But in terms of data speeds on 3G, AT&T is ahead of Verizon. And also my consideration was that most countries in Europe use GSM, which is the technology AT&T uses, and in parts of Asia and Latin America. And so I think there's more GSM coverage outside of the world. So I was happy that I ordered because at least I had locked it in. And um, and in the next few hours, I was really happy because shortly after I ordered with five to seven days shipping, uh, the online store went to two to three weeks shipping. So that, you know, made me start to think, oh my God, this is going to be huge. Apple's going to really sell lots of these because they're selling like hotcakes online. So whatever Apple's inventory is of the iPad 2, it's selling really, really quickly. Because remember, this is early in the morning. So as the day was going by, I was thinking, you know, I should go, you know, get there early. Uh, and normally I go to the Fifth Avenue store. It's the flagship store in New York for Apple. And it's actually the highest grossing retail store I think Apple has and the highest grossing retail store I guess in New York City per square feet and I had been at the Fifth Avenue store that's the one that's like a big 
Cube at Fifth Avenue and uh, what is it, 59th Street. And I was closer to where I was in the afternoon to Apple Store in um, the Meatpacking District, which is on West 14th Street and between 9th and 10th Avenue. And actually, at that store used to be a very inexpensive meat market grocery store where you could get very cheap and inexpensive groceries. And now it's like this really nice Apple store. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to be closer to there so I can get in line. So I went there and I, and now let me just tell you, it was kind of an ordeal. I think this was the longest I've waited. Uh, I've waited in line for the iPhone 4, the iPhone 3GS, the 3G, and this by far was brutal. And I didn't think it was going to be brutal because I got there and it was already a long line, but... Apple's on the corner of 14th and 9th Avenue, and the line went all the way west on 14th Street uh, to 10th Avenue, where there's a gas station. And then at 10th Avenue, the line went up 10th Avenue, so to you know to 15th Street, to 16th Street, to 17th Street, and I don't know, I don't know how far, but I was positioned before 5 o'clock right at the corner of 10th Avenue and 14th Street, so essentially the same block as the Apple store. Well, five o'clock came and, you know, it moved a little bit, the line, but not very fast. But let me just tell you before we get into that, I mean, the Apple employees who were working the line, they were making sure that people weren't cutting in line. The line had to have gaps because there were driveways to the various gas stations and stuff that's on the street. And so there had to be gaps in the line. And they had Apple employees sort of guarding the line making sure the queue stayed honest. And the people around me were very pleasant. There was a, a young guy uh, from high school, like behind me with his mother, and he had bought the iPad, the original iPad, like 17 days earlier. So he was coming to the Apple store to replace it with the newer iPad too. And there was a guy in front of me, I think he was from Europe or maybe an Englishman, and, you know, that Apple store is in a very swanky, uh, stylus, you know, st uh, um, very, uh, the stores around Apple are very sort of high-end sort of fashion boutique stores. Uh, there's Stella McCartney, uh, who's, um, you know, the Beatles McCartney's daughter. There's Alexander McQueen. And so as you're slowly making progress across 14th Street, waiting um, to crawl to the Apple store, you go by these really beautiful, you know, um, fashion, fashion stores, very expensive too. And this whole area used to be a meat packing area. I mean, uh, only like 10, 15 years ago, there were a lot of active meat packers there. So you've got sort of this sort of chic clothing stuff going on there where there once was, were butchers, so, so anyways, but I was just astonished how slowly the line moved because, you know, the, they started selling the iPads at 5 p.m. And I didn't actually make it into the Apple store, which was just on the other side of the block, till 7.30, two and a half hours to go a block. And there were blocks and blocks and blocks of people behind me, you know, I, I mean, I was definitely, at 5 o'clock, I was more than halfway, well over halfway up the line. And the guy in front of me, when we finally got into the Apple store, he was astonished because basically the iPads were being sold on the second floor. So when you finally got to the Apple store, they would take you as a group up the spiral staircase and make sure that nobody tried to sneak in the line. And the reason they did that is because Apple still let everyday customers come in to shop on the first floor for Macs or for Apple TVs or whatever. And actually, it was very interesting. As we were going up the spiral staircase, air escorted by Apple employees uh, to go to like additional queuing pens on the second floor, 
this young woman with red hair and a knapsack who had just bought something on the on the ground floor almost with like perfect timing she sort of jumped into the spiral staircase and joined our group going up the staircase trying to you know make it look like that she was part of the group from the outside that had been queuing that was now allowed to come in and enter the queue inside and I don't know if someone in our group said something to an Apple employee, but the next thing I knew, I heard Apple employees talking to their walkie-talkie, identifying um, to the, to other Apple employees on the second floor. Hey, you know, spot the girl with the knapsack and the red hair. She penetrated the line illegally or jumped into it. And as soon as she got into the queuing pen up there, like a sort of a big Apple bouncer got up there and basically said miss you you know you have to come with us you have to leave the apple store right now in other words it was like a major violation and it's funny i mean i was glad you know that they caught her because it was really crummy of her to so sneakily try to like jump in the line when all these people had been waiting hours and hours and hours waiting and on the other hand i was thinking you know what is this is this like you know, did she commit a crime like breaking into Fort Knox or something like that or the Mint? Um, you know, so you have to put things in perspective here. I mean, people are just trying to buy a device. But anyway, so now when we finally, after two and a half hours of waiting, we get into the Apple store, the guy in front of me, um, he was really pissed. And I don't blame him because there were all these Apple employees and everybody was kind of nonchalant. And not really working very fast or very hard. Plus, they were very inefficient. Now, here's the thing that doesn't make sense. The iPad, unlike the iPhone, does not require a subscription or, and, and mandatory connection to a cell phone. So, you know, that's one major distinction. And the iPhone, when you buy the iPhone at the Apple Store, you have to connect it. So you would think that selling an iPad in an Apple store would be, you, you could do much quicker than selling an iPhone because when you sell the iPhone, you have to connect it to AT&T or Verizon now. You can't just sell it unconnected. And, and so that takes more time. So the iPad, all you have to do is really just hand the box to the person. And it, most Apple stores have people roaming around with, these um, sliding card readers so they could just read your credit card and that's it they should just be handing these things out swiping the credit card you could just have like a, a couple of lines you know get it here's the verizon line here's the 64 gigabyte line but instead there was like this long queue when you got in the apple store and then someone would come and take you and ask you what you want and and then so that was slowing things down. And the other thing that was slowing things down was that they were offering to have people activate their iPad in the store. Now, the iPad has to be activated through iTunes. So if you don't have iTunes on a PC or a Mac at home or have a friend who has one, it makes sense to activate it at the Apple Store. But, but really, most people don't need that. But there was a lot of that going on, too. So... Here's the thing that I think was just crazy, which was the iPad selling at this 14th Street store was much slower than any processing of iPhones and, and on opening day at, and the, like on, on the Fifth Avenue store. So I think it's just also the store, too. I think I, I don't know if it was just um, the 14th Street store or or this event, but I suspect that. The Fifth Avenue store is just much more well run than the 14th Street store. It just seemed really disorganized. And so the guy in front of me was really furious, fur furious. And I was too that, my God, there's like huge lines of people. And this is just being processed so slowly. They clearly had iPads. When I got there, they were only kind of low on the 32 gigabyte uh at t 3g model uh, they had the 64 gigabyte uh iphone in black with at t that's what i bought and when i got home i canceled the one that i did online 
So I didn't get out of there till about eight o'clock. So this was like at least a, I don't know, four hour ordeal. Um, but I have my iPad too, and it's amazing. Uh, I, I don't regret waiting in line. It's exhausting, but it's just truly amazing. And um, I'll tell you more about that on the iPad podcast. Okay, so one of the things that made me really, really happy uh, this week on March 9th was that Apple released iOS 4.3 for the iPhone and iPod and iPod Touch, iPad and iPod Touch. And um, what's interesting is that Apple TV 4.3 was also, uh, Apple TV also received an update. 4.3, I guess, uh, related to the Apple TV. So the Apple TV had an update, and it was a, boy, was it a huge update, and I think it's going to really transform the future of Apple TV. So the update basically put two new apps on the the Apple TV 2. And the two new apps, in addition to Netflix and YouTube, There's now an MLB.TV and NBA League Pass access app. So basically, the NBA has an app on the Apple TV, and so does Major League Baseball. Now, Major League Baseball has been particularly good at the Internet and iDevices because they've already had an MLB app for the iPhone and for the iPad, and you pay for the app. But the real killer feature is you pay for a subscription and then you can watch live games over the internet on your iDevices as well as archived games and um, similar stuff for Major League um, NBA Basketball League. So, But why is this huge? Well, let me just tell you about Major League Baseball. Like I'm looking at this story. GigaOM reported on it. And um, GigaHome has a great headline here. GigaHome.com, basically, headline says, MLB and NBA team up with Apple TV. Cord cutters rejoice. And the reason cord cutters rejoice is because the cord that needs to be cut is the cord we all have to satellite and cable companies. Because satellite and cable companies, we're paying them a lot of money to get television through these cable boxes and satellite boxes. And if we could just get great content through the internet, our costs might come barreling down. Now, Major League Baseball charges um, $99 a year for a subscription. And it allows you to watch live spring training and regular season games for $99 a year. And you can also watch archive games and check out Home and Away broadcasts if you remain a premium level subscriber for $119.99. So that's $120 a year. So for $10 a month, you get incredible baseball content streaming and archived on your Apple TV. Now, so that's $10 a month. You add that in to to um you know netflix netflix i think costs i don't know like nine dollars a month netflix gives you great um sort of archive tv shows and movies and kids stuff so that's uh that would be just twenty dollars a month and uh similarly if you get the uh, nba that's maybe altogether thirty dollars a month but look for cable i pay i pay a fortune i pay You know, between the internet, which is about, I guess, $40 a month, and two cable boxes, and I don't know, the channels and some, I think I pay for HBO, it comes to another altogether like $175 a month. So I'm paying like $135 a month for TV. So look, if you count the 30 just from Netflix, NBA, and um, the cable, that's 70 um, you know, I can still buy some other stuff on the internet, like Hulu or something. Um, so the point is, I think 
I think the internet is going to help us save money. Now, anyway, so I've got the uh, Apple TV now on, and it's so cool. So under the column, that's the internet column, now you see Netflix, MLB TV, NBA, YouTube, podcasts, and mobile me. And I got to tell you, like, I haven't even subscribed yet. Um, actually, let me tell you one thing that's really annoying is in my bedroom, the... Um, I have a big TV that's near my iMac, and the Apple TV clicker, it it somehow is triggering my iMac also, which works on the clicker as well as the TV. So you have to be very careful with your point. But look, even without a subscription, the MLB.TV app has really cool things. Um, it has, you, when you enter it, you've got this screen and there's sort of floating team symbols on the left. And there's a menu. And the menu, the first thing you see is selection today's games, standings, team by team, MLB.com on iTunes, and settings. So let's go through these things. So if you go through today's game, like when I go just now, it's accessing and it's pretty quick. And it says Saturday, March 12th, 2011, 19 games. And you can just see the games that are coming up listed. Now, I scroll down. I'm a Red Sox fan, and there's a Red Sox Marlin game, and it says Live HD. And if I select it, let's see what it'll say. Oh, then I need to put in my login ID, which you have to go on the internet. You can't create an account with MLB.TV through the Apple TV. You have to go to www.mlb.com slash Apple TV and you can create your own ID. So anyways, right there I'd be able to get live high definition spring training game. And even if you don't have the account though, it gives you the score. So right now the Red Sox are in the first inning and they're leading one nothing. And you can scroll through and see other games. Let's see, the Yankees are playing uh, uh, Washington and let's see, Pittsburgh. Okay, so anyways, that's the first menu. Then under standings, you click that and you don't have to have a subscription you get the standings and if you right click you get the National League standings and National League West so it goes through the different um, divisions you got the American League East you got the American League West you got the National League division so it's it's very cool so let me go back so in addition to um, uh, standings you've got the next level down is team by team and so now you can drill down and again I'm doing this without having any subscription so this parts free and I can uh, scroll through let's pick the Red Sox it has every team in baseball and I and I select the Red Sox and I suddenly I get the the games coming up for the Red Sox their schedule the recent games I can see archived games if I want to go an archive game sorry video is not available for this spring game high quality video for every regular season game but anyways it looks like some content is available others not then there's MLB.com on iTunes and it shows you what Major League Baseball has on iTunes and you can buy it so let's look at the first you know it's got that sort of I uh, Apple TV interface these squares uh, of the content. They're like these squares. And so let's see, the first square is World Series 2010. So I, I click that and that I guess takes me right to iTunes and I can buy for 99 cents each game of the World Series. So that's pretty cool. And if I press the home button, the menu button, I go back to MLB.com and iTunes. If I, It goes right back to the MLB app. So it's integrated with iTunes, but you're not stuck in iTunes what you once you get there. 
Okay, now settings. Let's see, what do we have for settings? Settings, you have the sign in. If I click that, it wants my login ID, but I have to go to the website on the computer. And scores, let's see, under scores, you can hide the scores or show. So there aren't a lot of settings. So it's very, very cool. Now the MBA app, the MBA app is, um, according to gigaohm.com, um, you know, we're already in the middle of the basketball season. So you get limited access to just seven teams games, seven teams. In other words, of all the NBA teams, you can follow seven of them for $64.95. So for $65 or for $99.95, or $100, you get access to all NBA games. Now, that's, you know, that might not be such a great, great deal because we're already well into the, to the, to the um, NBA season. But if you're really a big fan and you love the playoffs, that's great. But you, with NBA League Pass, you get, you'll get every regular season game live and archived, but only up to 24 hours afterwards for standard subscribers. So I guess it's worth paying the premium service. So let's take a look at what the app, it's the same similar structure as the NBA. You've got games and you click on that and it gives you what games are coming up. So there are nine games today. Um, uh, you've got Utah, Chicago, Portland, Atlanta, Philadelphia, Milwaukee, I, and then you got standings. So look, I'm not paying anything, and I'm gonna. I see the standings uh, in the uh, Western Conference. San Antonio is at 53 wins, 12 losses, and and in the Eastern Conference, Boston with 46 wins, 17 losses. And then you got game highlights. Is the next section, and here. There's free stuff. Um, so there's some free highlights of games here in the NBA one. So let's see. Let me um, let me click the one. Menu the Man Magnificent. And I guess it's um, highlights of a Spurs game. And I get, you get, you get, I guess, you, you can hear it. It comes up pretty quickly. It's very cool. Um, so this is cool. I mean, I, if you you know if you you want to see what's going on in other games, you can get highlights, and it looks like it's for free. And then again, you got NBA on iTunes, and that takes you straight to the iTunes app. Let's take a look at 2009. I, don't, I guess there's there's no 2010 playoffs. Uh, oh, here it is. Game of the year. All right. NBA 2009 playoffs. And you can buy those for 99 cents a game. So, um, you know, altogether, he, I mean, here's my thoughts. This is great because, because now you, you're getting closer to being able to cut the cord. And, you know, one of the things that I want to talk about is other ways to cut the cord. Okay, so one of the other ways to cut the cord that I want to talk about is the iPad. Because the iPad can really become, I think it's the future of the Apple TV. I think the, I think the cheapest iPad, the $499 one, is essentially an ideal Apple TV. And you may be scratching your heads and saying, how is that possible? How is it possible? It's a mobile device. And here's why. Apple released as part of the new a iPad the uh, something called the Digital AV Adapter, and it cost $39. And I paid $39 for it. And what it is, it's a, it's a dock connector for the Apple TV 2 that has HDMI out connection as well as a as a USB connection so that you can, um, or a dock connection so you could charge the Apple, the iPad too, 
while the HDMI is connected out. And the HDMI is there because one of the big features of the iPad 2 is the ability to mirror, mirror out the content and what you see on the iPad 2. Now this is significant because before with the AV adapter, which is a VGA adapter, you could only a few apps could show stuff outside the iPad on the screen, like Keynote. Keynote could do it. Certain photo, your photos could, but not the videos in your photo thing. But Apple TV is now saying with this HDMI out, you can hook up uh, by HDMI your iPad to a big screen. And most big screen TVs, plasma and LCDs, use um, HDMI inputs for video and audio. So here's the thing. I hooked it up to my, I got almost a 40-inch uh, Panasonic TV. And... It's amazing because essentially your apps on your iPad essentially become TV apps. And because this, this dock connector has both the ability to charge the iPad and have an HDMI connection, you could just buy a $499 iPad and keep it next to your big screen TV and that becomes the controller and that becomes the content provider for your TV. So here are some of the things. Now, there is um, there there are like Hulu and other TV streaming apps on the iPad, and some of them aren't on the Apple TV. Like there's this Al Jazeera English. Now Al Jazeera is this Middle Eastern network, but you know they have an English language version of of their TV network that's really staffed by people from the BBC and Americans. I knew somebody who's an American and who's actually I knew a woman from New York who worked for Ted Koppel who's Jewish and she worked for Al Jazeera TV for a couple years when it started. But because its name is Al Jazeera and because we, you know, we at one point bombed Al Jazeera when we uh, invaded Iraq th for the second time. Um, Al Jazeera TV is not distributed through cable television or broadcast over the air. So the only way you can get Al Jazeera TV, which you can get for free, is on the iPad app. And actually, have you ever listened to Leo Laporte's uh, Mac Break Weekly? Alex Lindsay, who's not Mr. Political, loves Al Jazeera TV because it's just this great news content. They did a good, great job covering the whole Egyptian uprising. So if you like international coverage. so But you can't get it on a TV, and you can't get it anywhere except on the Internet and through uh, a, an iPad app. So here's the thing. The iPad app, which is not full you know, screen iPad app, so you hook it up, the iPad, and all of a sudden you have this Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera TV streaming to your big stream, t uh, big TV. And so suddenly, like, I have another channel. And I tried other things, too. I mean, Pandora streams, the Pandora app will stream there. Now, you can also do some of this through AirPlay, but some stuff doesn't go through AirPlay. Like, I noticed... Um, AirPlay, which is the ability to send it wirelessly to your Apple TV through the iPad. Well, some some content only like the audio goes through. So, for example, um, if I tried to do an AirPlay of a Al Jazeera TV to my Apple TV, only the audio goes, not the video. But with the HDMI connection, um, both the video and audio goes through. So this has the ability, if you want to cut the cord, if you have an iPad and an Apple TV, actually don't get the Apple TV, just have an iPad, Now the and you can get all this content. Now one thing that kind of would be nice to do is well, how would you control the Apple TV, the iPad, if you were using it like an Apple TV? You'd have to go up to it or have a very, and you know, and then start the app. Um, now, what you could do is just have a very long HDMI cord. 
so you're if if you're in a room that um if you're in a room that's not too big you could just hold the uh, ipad and that would be your controller if you had a long hdmi cable but maybe somebody will make like a way to control the um ipad remotely now we we already know there are apps that work on the iphone and mesh with the ipad like there's the uh, there's that camera plus camera a and camera b app where you can you can have the through bluetooth your ipad tethered to an iphone and then the ipad would trigger the iphone taking a picture and then having that picture sent in real time over to the ipad and meanwhile the scrabble game you know the um that you can have a scrabble app on the iphone that would be the tiles and then the scrabble board would be on the um ipad so actually that's one thing i want to try you know i didn't think about that because having the ipad 2 hooked up by hdmi if you've got the scrabble game you've got now the board would be on your big tv and you could control the board with your um with your iphone like you know if you had multiple players with the scrabble uh, app on their iphone they could look up at a big tv and that's where the board would be because it would be mirrored off of the ipad so this HDMI connection from the iPad to a big TV is just phenomenal. It opens the doors to many, many, many things. And I'm going to talk more about that tomorrow on my iPad podcast. So check it out on iTunes. Okay, so finally I want to talk about a very cool article that was in the New York Times about a blog... And the blog is kyleconroy.com. That's K-Y-L-E-C-O-N-R-O-Y.com. And it's slash Apple stock PHP. And basically, this guy put together a nice little chart. And the heading of his blog post is, what if I had bought Apple stock instead? And he basically cataloged, and you can um, sort the catalog, I guess every uh, Apple product from when Steve Jobs returned to Apple in 1997, I guess that's, so the, 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 the products start in November, on November 10th, 1997, and it goes forward to, let's see, the latest being, uh, he's got it through 2010, April 13th, 2010. So he's got lots of products. And basically, the point of his analysis is, what if you had bought Apple stock instead of a certain product? The point being that Apple stock has really gone up more than 40 times in seven years and a lot since 1997. So he gives, so I guess he took the the retail price of the product as listed at the time. He tracked that down and then found the stock price for Apple at the time, and then you can see what it is in today's value. So let's take the, I guess, the first product uh, that came out in 1997, um, November 10th, the Apple Power Macintosh G3 233 megahertz desktop. Now, I think I had that Macintosh, because that sounds like the specs that I had. So that original price was $2,400 in, in uh, 1997. And if you had bought, if you took that money at the time and instead of buying that computer, bought Apple stock, today, I guess with Apple stock at $350 a share, that $2,400 investment would be now worth $139,000 and one hundred eighty five dollars so that's incredible almost a hundred forty thousand dollars so now i mean hopefully you bought these computers and bought apple stock i mean i bought some apple stock and you know i didn't make that much but i have a decent invest return 
So, um, I mean, it's very interesting. Like, um, the returns vary depending on when you bought them and the amount. Um, so you can also sort by today's value. So, like, the thing that the, th the thing that has the smallest return is the Apple iPod Shuffle 2G late 2008, which was re released on September 9th, 2008. And the original price was $49, and today it would be worth $87 if you had bought Apple stock at the time. Um, you can also sort by original price. So the most expensive original price was the also released in November 10th 1997 was the Apple PowerBook G3 250 the original Kanga 3500 my goodness that was in 1997 the original retail price was $5700 and you that would be now worth $330,000 if um you had invested in Apple stock. So this is a very fun and cool website. And you can check out the prices of almost every product, like, you know, MacBook, iPod, um, et cetera, that came out between in that time period, really November 97 through 2010, I think, April. So it's very, it's a fun website. But also really gives you a sense of how successful this company has been and, you know, how far its products have come. Okay, so that's it for episode 62 of the Apple podcast by the MaxFuture.com website. This is Lex. This is March 12th and 2011, my first full day with an almost a first full day with the iPad 2. Thanks for listening. If you have any suggestions or comments, please feel free to leave a voicemail on Google Voice at 617-826-9676. That's 617-826-9676. Or me, email me at maxfuture at gmail.com. And you can check out the website at maxfuture.com. And also, remember, I have the iPad podcast where I'll go much more into the iPad too and some of the cool features. Thanks for listening.